OK, so yeah, tonight I'm going to uh, talk about whale track and learning from your sightings. So I'm going to talk about uh, why we ask for your data to be sent in, your sightings to be sent in, uh, what we can kind of gain from that information, the, thing, the insights we can get into the animals. And I'll also share very briefly at the end some of the projects that we're using the data for uh, currently and future papers that will hopefully be coming out as well. Uh, so I'm sure you all know who the trust is, but in case anyone here is new, uh, the Hebridean Whale and Dolphin Trust is based in Tobermory on the Isle of Mull. We've been around since 1994 and our goal is for whales, dolphins and porpoises to be protected and valued throughout the Hebrides. So we do this through things uh, such as our research on our vessel Silurian, uh, which travels around the West Coast collecting data on the cetaceans um, in our waters. We do it through our education programme and our community engagement projects, and that includes our citizen science projects such as Whale Track. So citizen science is at the heart of everything that we do at the Trust. Uh, we've been collecting public data, um, sightings data since 1990, and we work really closely with different communities across the West Coast so that we can better understand these animals in order to protect them. So um, working with different um, communities and people across the West Coast allows us to collect a lot more data than we would just relying on our research vessel Solarian. So it's really important to, to gather as much information across the Hebrides so we have that whole um, the whole picture really of what's happening in our waters. So as I'm sure uh, a lot of you know about Whale Track, because I think a lot of you would have seen the email through um, Whale Track and in the newsletter, uh, but we did start Whale Track in 2017. We upgraded our infrastructure so that it was easier for people to submit their sightings to us. It gave a standardized method to collect really robust data from the people that were sending in their sightings. Um, we wanted to upgrade it further this year as well, so that it was even easier for people to submit their records to us. So we went through a series of talks with our stakeholders and our users to get some feedback. And we launched the brand new app at the start of this year. So I'm not going to go through all of the new features. You can see some of them on the screen there. Um, I did do a talk a few months ago. So if you are interested in the upgrades and also how to use Whale Track if you're new to it, um, there is a talk that I recorded that is on our YouTube channel. So do have a, a little look at that. So these are some of the uh, stats that we have. Now, this is raw data from Whale Track. We've not analysed it or corrected it for effort yet. This has just been pulled as raw information. So since we launched in 2017 up until uh, 2022, so just um, I think this is from the end of October this, this year, we've got nearly 4,000 users using Whale Track, which is absolutely incredible. And they have submitted uh, over 28,000 sighting reports. And that equates to over 194,000 individual animals being reported. So it's an incredible effort that people are putting in. And the amount that we can learn from all these sighting reports is, um, is really, really valuable. So the main bulk of the talk this evening is what we have learned, what we are learning, what we still have to learn, which is a lot. Uh, so I'll be looking at this in the following categories, things such as um, what we've learned about time, place, biodiversity, the population, behaviour and health of these animals. So I'm going to break it down into those sections. So firstly, time. Uh, we've got a lovely graph here. I will admit we do need to update it. This one goes up to um, 2020, so I am working on um, getting an updated one. But this graph shows all the sightings sent into us uh, monthly between 2017 and the 2020 period. And as you can see, uh, there is a noticeable difference in terms of the sightings across the seasons. So sightings increase in the summer months. Um, this could be due to the influx of summer visitors like minke whales and common dolphins. Um, but there are other factors that will influence uh, this, this graph, really. So during this time, there'll be more people spending time uh, out on the coast. They'll be doing their wildlife watching. They'll be going out for walks. They'll be going out on their boats. So this can influence the data that comes in as well. 
Uh, it is really important and I do always like, especially this time of year, to emphasise that gathering data year round is crucial. Um, it helps us understand the movements of seasonal and migratory species more and the reports from whale track play a huge part in growing this evidence base of what's happening in our waters and the changes that are taking place. Um, so we are really keen to keep receiving uh, reports all year round. Uh, I've been working with our whale track data recently and we definitely get uh, less sightings uh, in the last few weeks uh, and that is just because there are less people out there um, watching it's cold it's wet so yeah if you if you are near the coast and uh, you do see anything we would love to to get your sighting report still So sightings can be influenced by a lot of different factors. So I've already said summer visitors would be one of them, the migratory species that come into our waters and the people that are watching. Uh, one of the big things is we have an amazing um, number of boat operators that contribute a huge amount of data to us when they're out doing their wildlife um, tours. So throughout the summer months, we get a lot of data from them. And obviously throughout the winter months, they're not running as much. So um, that will be one influence on the amount of sightings that we get between the summer and the winter and I do want to say a huge thank you to all of those operators uh, it's absolutely amazing the amount of data that they do send in to us and then obviously in the summer as well uh, the weather conditions can play a huge part as well so what the water's doing and what the weather is doing um, if it's calmer if it's nicer out it'll be easier to see these animals uh, in the winter if it's wet windy really choppy it'll be harder to see these animals so we do ask for environmental conditions when you submit your sightings because this can influence the ability to spot these animals and that can then be used in the analysis of the sighting reports coming through to us So we do know that we have uh, resident species across the, the West Coast, so they can be seen year round and there is a list um, there of some of the species that we can see throughout the year. One of them being the, the Wee Harbour porpoise there, so that is our smallest cetacean. Um, only growing up to about 1.9 meters but they're usually smaller and they can be seen all year round but usually it's a lot easier to see them in calmer seas and we do have very limited information about porpoises in the winter so any winter sightings of porpoises are very very valuable so if you're seeing them uh, in the next few months throughout winter please do send them in to us. Uh, the West Coast is a very important area for them. So there is a special area of conservation designated for harbour porpoises. And this is estimated to help protect around 5,000 animals. So, um, yeah, they, they might be the smallest, but they're definitely one of my favourites. And they they um, sometimes underrated. So, yeah, even if you see a just a harbour porpoise, just a harbour porpoise is still a good sighting. So please, please do send it in. Uh, we also then get the migratory species that I have mentioned a couple of already. So um, the common dolphins are on this list. They are typically thought of as summer visitors. However, we are now receiving community sighting reports of common dolphins year round. And I am going to talk a little bit more about what we're learning about common dolphins in a few moments. So just to touch on effort related sightings data. So this is kind of gold standard data. So if you ever get a chance to do effort um, watches, either watches from land or excursions, uh, this is something that we would be very, very happy to be receiving. So uh, effort based watches allow us to uh, basically correct the data for the effort during the analysis. So it's a brilliant way to uh, use the data to calculate the density of sightings in an area and better understand and um, abundance as opposed to just the, the presence of these species. So and it can help us detect changes in things like sightings rates as well. Um, so the time that you watch or how long you travel for will obviously influence what it is you're seeing. So just to kind of put it in a nice picture format, uh, a simple way of looking at it is on here, first look, you might think there's more animals uh, on the right hand side. Uh, you've got three fins instead of just the one fin. But then if you take into account the effort that was put in, so there was one dolphin seen for the two kilometres that were travelled, and then there was three dolphins seen, but you travelled six kilometres. So when you're doing the analysis of that, you can still see that only one dolphin was seen for every two kilometres you've travelled. And this is the same for uh, how long you watch as well. So the, the effort allows us to, to um, analyse more and we can combine and compare different data sets because of the effort that's been put into it. So 
Uh, I'm just going to plug a little bit here of effort based watching. So if you are um, out on a boat or on a ferry, please use excursion mode. That would be amazing. And if you're out on a nice wintry walk um, around the headlands or anywhere near the sea, stop for a minute with your, 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 your hat and your gloves and your scarf on, keep it nice and toasty and have a wee watch and record um, what it is you're seeing, even if you're not seeing anything, because as everyone says, no data is still data. So um, yeah, please still uh, send in those, those sightings uh, or no sightings if that you don't see anything. Uh, and then it's not always possible to carry out effort based watches. So your casual opportunistic uh, sightings are still very, very important to us. So we can understand things like seasonal movements with these sightings. So such as the first and last uh, sightings of individual species throughout the year. And then we can compare these year on year as well. So things like uh, in April, we start seeing minke whales appearing, basking sharks appearing. And then these are more concentrated throughout sort of like July, the summer time and then we also see those anomalies so um you know in previous years we started getting reports of those common dolphins being seen in winter in Alapool uh, and then we started seeing that year on year so it builds that picture of the change in the environment over time uh, which I'll touch on even more in a little while as well so um yeah we can learn from these one-off casual sightings because they will start sort of building a picture up over time uh, so place. Excellent. So community sightings um, provide a great coverage of the area. So obviously we go across the West Coast um, on Silurian, uh, surveying as much of the seas as we can. But there is just it is just us. It's just one boat um, and lots of eyes on that one boat. But we can only travel so far um, and it does depend on the weather conditions. Whereas if we've got hundreds and hundreds or thousands of people watching out across the West Coast, we are going to get a much better idea of the distribution um, across our seas. So the map that's on the screen is uh, a new map this year that we were um, working on a few weeks ago. So this is the sightings data for 2017 up to 2021. We haven't yet sorted out the 2022 data. Um, and this just shows you the amazing number of sightings that we have been getting. So the blue is all of the Axi excursions and the orange is our ca casual sighting reports. So this shows you the amazing distribution of the species uh, of the animals throughout the West Coast. And then this map is just a screen grab from a random week on whale track showing you the diversity and distribution of these animals as well. So it's pretty incredible um, what it is we're seeing on the West Coast. And this allows us, all of this data um, allows us to learn so much more about what habitats are being used because we can work out, you know, the depth of the seabed, what food might be in that area. So what these animals are using these areas for. And this informs our conservation efforts to protect these species and these specific areas that they're using. So I mentioned common dolphins a couple of times. Uh, I'm now going to talk about them fully. Uh, so we have seen a shift in their distribution in recent years. So in the early 2000s, uh, common dolphins were almost never seen up north around sort of Ullapool and Lewis area. So you can see in 2003, 2005, there's very few sightings of them there. Um, but as the years went on, the community data started showing that actually they became a regular occurrence in these areas. So we've got the map of 2015 to 2017 showing that there is actually a, a large number of species going further north. So we can see from this effort based data and um, from all the data that's been coming in and even just from um, anecdotal um, comments from uh, communities, and then looking at the data as well, that there has been a shift in their distribution. So obviously the question here is why? Uh, why are they moving? So that is something that we still don't have a certain answer for. Um, unfortunately, uh, it takes a long time to learn these things. So we know it's happening, but why? One of the reasons could be the warming of the seas. So these are a warm water species. Um, so that's why they used to be further south. But as the seas are warming, they can start heading further north. So, you know, that's one potential reason. You then have to start considering how might this impact our cold water species, such as the white beaked dolphins that are usually seen further north. Is there going to be an impact here? So uh, these are things that are still a question mark that we still need to learn. Um, and, you know, continuous monitoring and sighting reports coming in will help us sort of piece this together. 
So watching from land is a really good option um, if you can't get out to sea. So as you see there, 30% of our casual sightings are actually recorded from land. So a lot of people will think, oh, I need to go on a boat to see these animals. It's not necessarily the that's not necessarily the case. You can see these animals from land as well. So it does take a bit of patience. Uh, maybe having a good pair of binoculars helps as well. And really getting your eye in on what it is you're looking for. So a little bit of training helps with that as well. So if you ever want a training course, um, you know, get in touch with us. We can help you out. We also have pre-recorded ones that you could watch as well. Um, but one thing I will recommend is if you do like to watch from land, then having a look at our whale trail. This was a community initiative to encourage people to do land based watching. Um, it minimises any potential impact on both the environment and the animals. Uh, it reduces any unintentional disturbance and it's really accessible as well, because these are all places that you can get to um, either for free or, or just with a little bit of travel. You don't necessarily have to have a boat or pay out to go on a boat. Um, and, you know, again, plug, you can do a watch from land and do an effort based. And if you needed to get on a ferry in order to get to the location, uh, say you want to go to one of the islands, you can do an excursion while you're on the ferry as well. So some of the animals you can see when you are watching from land uh, are things like the, our coastal species. So bottlenose dolphins uh, are very comfortable close to shore. They're fantastic to watch from land. They can be really active, um, acrobatic. They're very large animals, so they are quite easy to spot as well. And these ones are really good for our photo ID as well. So being on land somewhere still, you can get some really good photos of these animals. So if you do have any photos of bottlenose dolphins, um, their fins or videos with a clear picture of their fin, please do uh, share them because we do put a bottlenose dolphin um, photo ID catalogue together. So it'd be really interesting to see which individuals you're seeing. Um, so from community sightings and from photographs, we've been able to um, kind of discover that there's two distinct resident um, groups of bottlenose dolphins in the Hebrides. There's um, an inner Hebrides pod, which is about 40 individuals, maybe, maybe a few more. It's always hard to have an exact count. And then there's an outer Hebrides pod as well, which are seen kind of around Barrow Way. And these are a smaller number um, around about like um, low teens. We also do get offshore groups seen as well. So having the, the sightings data, but the fin ID photo, the photos as well, really helps us learn how many different populations we have, which areas they use, uh, whether they, they travel large distances as well. And this is all quite recent data as well. So a lot of this has been learned in the last 20 to 30 years. Um, 2006 was when we first suggested that actually the bottlenose dolphins were resident on the West Coast. So it's all quite recent and there's always more to learn. Um, for example, I'm going to go on to minke whales in a little while. We still don't know exactly where minke whales go in the winter. It's thought to be off the coast of northwest Africa, but, you know, we don't know the exact places. So there's still a lot to learn about these different animals. Um, I will touch on these maps here so you can kind of see how important community sightings are. The one on the left is our Silurian sighting. So we don't come across bottlenose dolphins that often on Silurian because we're going out to, you know, more deeper waters, open ocean. We don't hug the coast as much, whereas we get a lot of sighting reports from the community. So it really is those community sightings that are really building this picture up for us. We can also track animals, not just in localised ranges like the bottlenose dolphins there, but also over wider areas. So within the UK and even, even globally as well. So um, an example here that you're probably all very aware of is the West Coast community. So this is John Coe. Um, very famous. Uh, many, many people know about John Coe. He's made headlines a few times, especially in 2021 when he was um, confirmed to have been seen in English waters down in Cornwall. Um, that was for the, the, the first time that it was confirmed that he'd been down there. Um, so, you know, piecing this all together using uh, communities' photos, their sighting reports, communicating with one another is really helping us learn what these animals are doing. Um, the Irish Whale and Dolphin Group have also had confirmed sightings of Jonco and Aquarius in Irish waters this year. Uh, you can see a few of the sightings up until 2021 on this map, but they've been seen several times this year as well in Irish waters. Um, we are going to work on all the sightings that we know of Jonco and Aquarius in the next few weeks, and I'm 
going to put a little blog together of all the places that we've had confirmation that they've been just to see where they've been traveling this year because on initial look it looks like we've had higher than usual sightings of them this year so it'll be it'll be interesting to actually see it all on a on a wee map Biodiversity. So I have talked uh, about a few different species, um, but the biodiversity in Scotland uh, is incredible. So we have 24 different species, which is a quarter of the cetacean species of the world. There's 90 in the world, about around about that. Um, that that's been recorded uh, on the west coast. So I will admit some have only been seen once, and others have unfortunately been seen dead. Um, that's just how scientists like to make their lists. So they'll record uh, any species that has been been reported as being seen. So whale track has 16 species that has been recorded and eight of those are regularly seen. And this map just shows the diversity of species. So the areas in red have more species that have been seen. And I will admit this is a Silurian based on Silurian data because that's all we've got the heat map for. But it just shows you the, the amazing diversity of species that that we have on the on the West Coast. And the sightings that we get through uh, whale track are really helpful for rare sightings, uh, especially because, you know, like I say, many eyes on the sea, they're going to be seeing things that, you know, we're not going to be able to see when we're just on Silurian. So things like uh, turtles. I know that um, in January, I think this year and last year, there was a turtle seen around Iona. Um, so that's really interesting to see that two years in a row there's been a turtle around there on in the same month. Um, there's also been this year sunfish reported. We've even had tuna get reported through whale track. So, um, you know, it's really interesting to see the different species uh, that are showing up in our waters. And as we record them throughout the years, we can start seeing if we're seeing them more, if we're seeing them less. And then I've sort of touched on, you know, sharing of data and photos across uh, kind of across the country, but even uh, globally as well. So uh, I do like to, you know, not everyone likes the new digital era and not everyone likes social media. However, it can be very, very useful in, in learning about these animals. So you've got local naturalists, you've got wildlife guys, you've got photographers, uh, you've got people who have just randomly seen something cool and shared it on social media. And then it's actually turned out to be something amazing. So we can track these animals and learn more about them um, just through people sharing photos and their sightings, even just on social media. So I will admit, I stalk Facebook. Facebook for humpback whale for humpback whale sightings for killer whale sightings especially John Cohen Aquarius because it, it does piece things together it, it isn't always reported to us um, so a good example even just from this year of that is um, humpback whales so they have been recorded quite a lot on the west coast this year I've seen I've been quite excited seeing the number of sighting reports coming through I have yet to seen one I would just like to put that out there I'm not bitter at all but um, a little bit uh, and thanks to the people sending in photos, Lindsay from the Scottish Humpback Whale Facebook group, who has put the catalogue together, was able to compare a tail fluke that uh, Rosie from the Hebridean Whale Cruises, I believe it was, uh, took a photo of and actually confirmed it was a brand new humpback whale, not in the catalogue. So that catalogue is now up to 100 individuals. And that just shows the sort of team effort that can happen. That's that's wildlife guides out on a boat, taking photos, sharing it with different organisations and building this picture up of actually a brand new individual is being recorded. So, um, yeah, it may not be everyone's cup of tea, but social media does does help. So populations, while I'm on um, photo ID, I'll keep talking about it. <laughs> Uh, we can learn a lot about individuals, but also groups and the populations of the species by using photo ID. So recognising an individual is kind of key to unlocking um, and understanding their life history, their population dynamics, the births that are happening, the deaths that are happening, uh, their social structures, and if there's any patterns in their movement as well. So um, photo ID for anyone that's not aware, is basically taking photos of the animal and using distinguishing features either on their fins or on their tails to work out who that individual is by matching it to other pictures that we have of them. So it's a really good um, non-invasive method for tracking these animals. So some of the things we've learned through photo ID uh, are births. So we will be able to work out if individuals are having births. So there's a really nice picture here of a Rizzo's uh, with a calf. 
and we do share and I'll talk a little bit about the data sharing in a little while but we do share our sightings and our photos so well and dolphin conservation work on our Rizzo's um, fin ID catalogue so we will share our images with them and they can help build up these sort of family trees um, of individuals but we also have the west coast community killer whale catalogue and unfortunately we can also see who is dying so one of the stories which i'm sure some of you are aware of is lulu from the west coast community um, she was found uh, washed ashore in 2016 and she was dead and they did a necropsy on her um, she was entangled, but she also had the highest levels of PCBs, which is a pollutant in her body. And this, you know, unfortunately helps us get an insight into how the rest of her population are doing, but how the other individuals are doing. Because if she's got that level of chemicals in her body, it's likely other individuals in her population will have those levels as well. Um, and unfortunately, we haven't seen... Uh, many we've only seen two individuals John Cone Aquarius in recent years so it is looking um like a, a sad outcome for the other individuals but it's not it's not confirmed but unfortunately it's looking likely they are the last ones um so yeah we can kind of learn a lot just from knowing who the individuals are and then there's still loads to learn. So I'm quite excited about um, the mystery pod, which I feel like there, there should, there's probably another name for them, but um, the mystery pod is what I'm using for now anyway. Uh, so in 2018, there was a pod of killer whales spotted from our research vessel, Silurian, uh, and we weren't able to match them with any other killer whales in the Scottish killer whale catalogue. We sent them to the Scottish killer whale catalogue as well, and they weren't able to ID them. So they became like an unknown mystery pod um, that had turned up in Scottish waters, uh, which was very, very exciting. And then in 2021, there was a um, citizen scientist who took a photo of some killer whales and sent it to Dr. Eve Jordan, and that's from the Norwegian Orca Survey. So this was in Norway. And she didn't recognize these killer whales as being from the Norwegian groups that she'd seen. So she checked the Scottish killer whale catalog and was able to match them with this mystery pod that was seen in 2018. So that was a huge moment because it was the first confirmed match of killer whales across Scotland and Norway. So that was just incredible. Um, and then they weren't seen again until this year, May 2022, uh, when a lady called Sarah Frost emailed us with some photographs of a group of uh, eight killer whales. And again, we kind of looked at the pictures and we sent them to the Scottish killer whale catalogue and they were able to match them with this mystery pod that had last been seen in Norway. So uh, it's just amazing. There's still so much to learn. There's different animals turning up all the time. And this is just this is from people sending in their photos and being like, who are these? You know, what's going on? So, yeah, there's still lots of questions to ask about this mystery pod and where they will show up next. Um, so, yeah, any photos you have, please, please do send them in. Uh, so behaviour. Uh, on Whale Track, we do ask you to, uh, when you report your sighting, to record what the behaviour is that you're seeing from the animals. So uh, this this is, there's a different few different reasons for this. So some of it is to help us to verify uh, the species, because some, some behaviours will be specific to certain species uh, or more likely seen in certain species. It also helps us learn what they're using that area for. So it might be that, oh, there's actually a lot of feeding taking place in this specific area by these specific species. This is a really good feeding ground. But even the sighting itself um, can help us learn a behaviour because some species will go to the same area yearly, such as minke whales. So um, Nobble is an example of this. So Nobble, I've been learning since I started here quite a lot about uh, Nobble. He's, he's a little celebrity, I think, on the West Coast here. Um, so he was, he or she, I'm not actually sure if it's a he, a boy or a girl, but was first recorded in 2002 and is one of the most recognisable minke whales um, across the Hebrides. So um, been seen now almost 60 times, I believe it's 58 times. Uh, and this year marks the 17th year in a row that Nobble has been spotted in Hebridean seas. Um, usually around the waters around Mole, 
normally around Ju July and August. So come July and August this year, everyone was waiting for the first sighting of Nobble and uh, good old Andy Tate sent a photograph in and we were able to confirm that it was Nobble. Um, this picture is actually from August this, this year. This is one of Andy's pictures that he sent in to us. Uh, but the fact that this individual is coming back to the same area year on year shows it is an important area for this species. And they are coming here um, to feed. So they are a migratory species and primarily they're coming to uh, Scottish waters to feed. So approximately every year, about 11,000 minke whales um, migrate, move northwards. Um, like I say, we don't know exactly where from, but from their um, when, from their northwest African sort of waters, and they come to the UK, and a lot of them end up in the Hebrides, and they're feeding on things such as sandhills and other shawling fish like herring and mackerel. And in 2020, I believe it was, um, yeah, in 2020. Um, I popped it onto this page because this links in with our basking sharks. A marine protected area was made. Um, you can kind of see it in the, the map here. The Sea of the Hebrides became a marine protected area. And this was designated for minke whales, but also for basking sharks. So they are another really good example of what we can learn from behaviour. So this is a picture of two basking sharks swimming nose to tail, which we believe is a courtship behaviour. Um, there's still a lot to work out and to learn, um, but that's what we believe it is. And this is showing that the areas these animals are coming to, um, they're coming to for important key life stages. So the sightings and the photos that have been getting sent into us is helping to protect specific areas for these species, such as the MPA that was made. And the MPA that was made for the basking shark was the first MPA um, ever for basking sharks. So it's it's making a huge difference. All this all this information that you guys send into us. Right. So health, I think it's the last one that I'm going to talk about. Um, so. From pictures, um, so I, I do emphasise, please send in photos, uh, from the pictures that you send in alongside your sightings, we can look to see if there's any health um, health issues that we should be aware of or know about certain animals. So we can see if there's any parasites on dolphins or if there's any lesions on them. Um, some of these will be normal and, you know, just natural. Some of them may be man-made. Some of them might be threats that we'd like to know about. So being able to look at these images, we can work out what's going on with the individual and then potentially what might be happening with the community of that species. Um, we can also see and kind of assess the extent of anthropogenic impact such as entanglement um, as well as monitoring like the animal's individual recovery so uh, we can kind of work out what's happening to these animals how often it's happening how many it's happening to so the top photo here is a dolphin that's potentially been hit by a propeller or some other sort of type of injury um i we believe this dolphin is still alive, but um, obviously we'd need more photos to sort of confirm that. But it does look from that picture that it's healed. But at least we know from that image that, you know, there is a risk of potential collision with boat propellers here. And then the bottom picture is a, a minke whale that has a box strap around its rostrum. Um, so, again, entanglement risks, uh, risks of, of marine litter. We can use these images to kind of assess the, the the risk that we have on the on the west coast, and hopefully try and find solutions and work with communities to to get to these solutions. Now, I like to include strandings, but I will say strandings. Um, sorry, whale track isn't a strandings. Um, kind of database but we do get people submitting reports of things such as um, dead stranded animals uh, which is fine what we do with those is we will hand them on to the appropriate um, organizations so what I do always recommend is if you see an animal if you see a dead stranded animal try and report it directly to the organization so SMAS which is the Scottish um, 
marine animal stranding scheme uh, they are the ones to contact if you see a dead uh, cetacean or seal in Scotland so you can report it through whale track but they're the ones that really need to know about it that's who will report it to if we see it on whale track the other thing that it's really helpful with is we can look at sighting reports and if you've recorded the behavior or put anything in the comments about what it is you're seeing we can analyze and assess whether it might be a concern and potentially um, British Divers Marine Life Rescue may need to be informed. So, for example, this year we had um, pilot whales that were seen close to shore. They're very notorious for mass stranding. So kind of as soon as those reports come in that they're close to shore, that they're, they're hanging around in certain areas, they're not moving off. They've been there for um, a, a little while now. That's the sort of thing I would then be reporting to the British Divers Marine Life Rescue. And again, I would emphasise that if you're ever concerned about the behaviour of an animal, um, to record to report it directly to them because they'll then be able to kind of get people in place a lot quicker than if we've seen it a day or so late. So um, yeah, it's always it's always good to sort of like send in the sightings, let us know the behaviours. But if you're concerned, go direct to them. But we will also be reporting it to them if we're concerned as well. So just to kind of finish up nearly, it's uh, about the protection of the animals. So um, I said I'd talk a little bit about the data sharing that we do. So we do share whale track data with other conservation organisations, with universities, with governmental bodies. Um, and there are a few things that are currently being worked on using our um, data. So we provided whale track excursion data to Nature Scott as part of a project to uh, estimate the trends in abundance and distribution of cetaceans and basking sharks. And this is to inform the development of a mobile species monitoring plan for Scottish um, territorial waters. So this is still not yet published, so we don't know what's going to come of it, um, but they are using our data to help inform that. Uh, we are also, um, alongside our partners from the Scottish Entanglement Alliance, incorporating our sightings data from whale track in research to better understand and quantify the entanglement risk of minke whales and humpback whales uh, in Scottish waters. So this is due for publica publication shortly, so keep your eyes peeled for that. And then finally, we also share our data with um, various PhD students who are doing suitable projects. So for example, there's a student uh, from SAMS at the moment working on minke whale ecology and habitat use, and they are currently using our whale track data as well. So all of this data is being used, it's being used now, it's being shared, um, and hopefully we're gonna learn even more from it. So your sightings, just to kind of round it all off, um, they build a long term data set. So the important thing to remember with the sighting reports you're, you're sending through is we're not going to learn something straight away from the report. Like, you know, the sightings we've got this year, they will go into a whole body of data that we've collected over the years. We need a long term data set to really start seeing these trends and to start understanding what is happening. Um, so it does take time to learn new things. But it is improving our understanding and knowledge of the species, of the um, marine environment, of how important it is and what they're using it for. And the more that we learn, the better we're going to understand them, the more we can inform decision makers and ultimately help protect these animals, help um, manage the marine environment better so that they can thrive in it. So just a slide on how you can get involved. Um, obviously, I keep saying it, send in your sightings um, all year round, preferably, and send in your photos. And if you can, carry out those effort-based watches and excursions and, you know, encourage other people to do the same. Um, I have popped a few other uh, organisation logos on this page because, you know, we're not the only ones you can report to. If you're ever uh, in England, you can report through Sea Watch. If you're in I Ireland, you can report through the Irish Whale and Dolphin Group. You know, there are other people who are collecting this information as well. So if you're ever uh, unsure, just have a look to see who the local people are that are collecting this information. Um, Whale Track now collects sightings Scotland wide. So it's not just West Coast. Um, you can report them Scotland wide now. And then I've popped up there the British Divers Marine Life Rescue. They're for live animals, live um, marine animals that you're concerned about. And then SMAS are for the dead ones.
Uh, and then I will just add, if you have a boat, if you're a boat operator, or if you just have a recreational boat, uh, looking into WISE is always um, a good thing because they will teach you more about the animals you may encounter, how you should interact with them. And it just shows that you're a responsible boat operator around wildlife. Uh, you can also, if you can't get out, if it's too cold, too miserable, and you're not able to get out to the sea and see these amazing animals for yourself, you can interact with whale track through either the app or through the website. You can have a look at what's being seen. You can have a little explore all the sightings. Um, so all the sightings that have been recorded will be on the website and on the app. So you can have a little wee nosy of what's been seen throughout the years. And then finally, I'm just going to plug um, my talk in December. So if you'd like to come on the 15th of December at seven o'clock, um, I'm doing a sightings celebration talk and this will be very much a two way sort of conversation. I'm going to share our stats for this year. So the number of sightings, number of animals, number of reporters, that sort of thing, but also some of my highlight reports that I've seen come through whale tracks. So some of those really cool sightings that I've been very excited sitting behind the desk and seeing that someone's seen something amazing while I'm stuck behind the computer screen. Um, and then I also want you guys to share what you've seen this year, your favourite sighting this year, and your hopes for next year, what you hope to see next year. Um, so what your must, must see animal is, what you'll be going to the coast every day to try and spot. Um, so yeah, I'd love for as many people to come to that as, as they can. So put it in your diaries, 15th of December. Um, I'll also be sending out the newsletter in December. So um, one of the things with the newsletters is I really want to get volunteers, like whale track users, to share their stories. So if anyone wants to be in one of our newsletters to just talk about, you know, what their favourite sightings been, why you use whale track, just anything um, around, you know, sightings and whale track. If you want to little write a little paragraph for us, please please get in touch, um, and we'll feature you in a future newsletter.